Hey everyone, this is Kevin from the ChessWebsite.com, and today we're in round seven of the 2016 Candidates Tournament. Winner of this tournament goes on to face Magnus Carlsen in November for the World Championship. This is halfway point in the tournament. There's 14 rounds in the tournament, so after this, we're going to have a pretty good idea of who is in striking distance. Uh, coming into this round, at the top, we have a tie between Levon Aronian and Sergei Kardiakin. Uh, at the bottom, we have a tie... Not the good tie that you want, uh, and that is Nakamura and Topolov. Now, today's match is between the guys at the bottom. We have Nakamura playing the white pieces and Topolov playing the black pieces. Both players have two points coming into round seven. They both have two losses uh, in the first six matches. Definitely not what you want to see. They have two losses uh, and four ties. Uh, Nakamura probably has the worst of it. He had the highest expectations probably out of anyone. In the last round, he had a drawn game going into the very end. On the 75th move, he did touch a piece that he did not intend to, was forced to then move that, and ended up losing in a heartbreaking fashion. Uh, went on to not go to the post-conference because he was pretty upset and got subsequently fined because of that. So he's just having a... A rough tournament. So many people expecting him to do well uh, with the World Championship being in the United States. It was going to be pretty cool uh, if he came out on top. A lot of people now hoping for Fabiano Cartuana to go ahead uh, with the American flag uh, to win the tournament. But both these players still in the hunt, but they're definitely going to have to have a big victory today. So we'll go ahead and get into it. Uh, both players have nothing to lose. Might as well play for the win. Uh, starts out with pawn 2d4 from Nakamura and then Topolov. Uh, responds with pawn to d5, followed by pawn c4, pawn c6, knight f3, knight f6, pawn e3, and then bishop f5. And this is the slob defense. Sometimes you may see the semi-slob where you play pawn e6 first. Uh, this does block the light square bishop from coming outside the pawn chain. It is very difficult sometimes to go ahead uh, and develop this bishop, depending on how white you know captures in this in the board here on d5 and how black recaptures. So a lot of times uh, you'll just see the slob, and that is just bring the bishop out here to f5 first, uh, and then later on going to play pawn to e6. Now, if you haven't played this lob defense or seen it in high-level play, uh, generally it's going to be somewhat of a clogged board state. And, and more times than not, a pawn to d4 opening, uh, unless it's a queen's gambit accepted line, which this is not. This is a decline line. It's usually going to be more clogged in the center of the board than maybe a pawn to e4 uh, opening up a little bit. So that's just kind of what to expect. But we see both sides just continue with development. Knight to c3. Pawn e6, just solidifying the pawn chain as we talked about here. Uh, knight h4, bishop back here after it takes. The pawn's going to recapture here on a g6. Double pawns here on the g file, uh, but that's completely okay. And these are kind of all the main lines. So both sides have options to kind of deviate from that but they're just kind of keeping it close to to their vest they don't want to give anything as far as any preparation away so far they're just kind of playing all the main lines uh, from here you know white has a few options could it play rook here to b1 could play pawn to h3 getting ready to play bishop e2 the castle on the king side that's fine uh, could also play queen b3 uh, now that the light square bishop is off the board uh, can start to really attack here on the queen side of the board so that's going up for the rook to b1 uh, knight to d7 almost is always uh, going to happen uh, and then pawn to c5 and nakamura is putting a lot of pressure because this dark square bishop is now going to have a tough time to get involved into the action. Sometimes you can feed in Keto on the king side. These pawns aren't moving anywhere, so it's going to be very difficult to bring the bishop here to g7. Uh, this square here on a c5 is very solidified. Why can't always push further with pawn b4? Uh, so, you know, bishop here to e7 to castle on the king side. Uh, that's kind of an option here, but as far as getting that dark square bishop involved, it's going to be very difficult. Now, on the opposite side, Nakamura does have a little bit of tough time getting his own dark square bishop involved into the game, uh, which is very common sometimes when you're playing pawn d4, pawn e3, and you don't have your dark square bishop uh, involved before then. But uh, pawn c5, a really, really good job of just blocking off a lot of the squares. Knight can't really move. Can't come here to b6 as well. So it's going to kind of hang out on the king side of the board. Pawn to a5. Just wants to make sure Nakamura is not completely dominating the queen side of the board. Uh, pawn to a3. Getting ready to push forward with pawn b4. 
Then bishop e7, as we talked about, and pawn g3. And Nakamura, I think it's fine either way. Bishop to e2, and then castle on the king side, or decides to go ahead and play pawn to g3. Fink head on the king side. Wants to make sure his opponent just does not completely dominate all these light squares in the center of the board. And if we look from Black's perspective, he really needs to be somewhat aggressive. He just can't sit back the entire time. You can see he's start to... Uh, choked a little bit as far as where he can go. Uh, his knights here can't do anything. His bishop really can't do anything. His queen really can't do too much right now. Uh, he can castle, but he's just kind of sitting there and allowing his opponent to do something. So he starts to push forward, pawn to e5, trying to block the center of the board, uh, blow it up, or just push further. Pawn to e4 is also going to kind of stop a lot of the threats that Nakamura has as well. Bishop to g2, uh, and then as we kind of see here, uh, pawn e4. So Topolov is controlling the light squares. On the opposite side, Nakamura is controlling the dark squares. Pawn b4, trying to blow up the, the queen side. And usually you can tell what side uh, one color is going to start to attack by which direction the pawns are kind of pointing an arrow to Omo. So these dark squares are kind of pointing towards the queen side, so Nakamura's going to be looking to attack on the queen side. And Topolov over here, his pawns are kind of pointing towards the king side. So his real threat that he has is starting to attack on the king side. Pawn takes on b4, pawn recaptures. Now knight's back here, f8. Uh, as we kind of said, there's nowhere for it to go, so it's going to kind of relocate here to e6. Uh, and then try to start to control the center of the board and the king side. Uh, pawn b5, knight e6, a bishop here, a d2, a castle on the king side, and then a knight to a4. So starting to get of his pieces over here on the queen side, uh, he has an attack. He can either play pawn takes here on c6 if he wants to, or he can either push forward with pawn to uh, b6. Also a threat. Uh, what White really wants to do is get one of his rooks behind enemy line. So rook here on the seventh rank is going to be invaluable. Uh, if he can even get it to the eighth rank, to, you know, depending on where his opponent is, that's going to be valuable as well. Uh, it's going to be difficult for this king to really, you know, sometimes he'll come to g7, uh, but he's going to be coming to this seventh or this h file right here, which White can really start to attack depending on where his pieces are, uh, especially if you can kind of open up this pawn right here, uh, then this dark square bishop can start to put a lot of pressure on this h6 square as well. And we see knight to g5, uh, pawn h4, just forcing the knight to move. The knight's going to come down here to f3, uh, takes here, and then pawn recaptures. Uh, interesting from... Topolov's perspective, that, that light square bishop wasn't doing too much. Topolov had control of the light squares right here. Uh, he had a great pawn chain right here. It kind of just looks like he wanted to start blowing some stuff up. He didn't feel like he had any aggressive plays. Because right now, this pawn just kind of hanging out. And the only defense it's really going to have is his minor pieces. Now, Nakamura can't just take right now because this queen is really the only protection that the knight has here on a4. So Nakamura wants to kind of have some trades over here, move his knight back, and then start to attack here on this f3 square. Pawn takes c6, pawn recaptures, and then knight back to c3, opening up the door for the queen to come here to f3. And then we see a pretty interesting move from Topolov. He decides to kind of blow up the whole thing, and he took a little while to kind of think about this. So it's a it's a pretty interesting line that I was not expecting to kind of see. I don't think many people were, but after the bishop takes here on c5, giving up a minor piece uh, for both a pawn advantage and just kind of a center control, which you did not have before. So after the pawn captures on c5, uh, then pawn push forward to d4. And so we see the pawn capture here on d4, and then queen to d4. Now, it's going to be real tough for the queen to take here. If it was queen to f3, uh, then all of a sudden rook to a3, and Toplov is all up in the business of white here. If we see, you know, a castle on king side, then all of a sudden queen to d2, uh, rook to c1. And you can see white's just kind of playing defense right now, which is not really the position that he wants to be. So after uh, queen to d4, uh, he recognizes that the pawn's still kind of sitting there. Uh, but for right now, he is up a minor piece. His opponent does have more pawns, uh, but he just needs to kind of hold tight 
not panic, not try to do anything too crazy. Uh, so first decides to go ahead and cast on the king side, get some protection for his king, and then he can worry about anything else on board. Now queen g4, uh, and then rook to e1. Just starting to activate this uh, a little bit, which I think is very really nice. Rook here to d8, uh, just putting more pressure on this d2 square. Also putting it down so the the queen would fall if the bishop moves. Uh, rook to b2, just adding a little bit of protection on this b or this d2 bishop. Uh, rook d4, just getting ready to bring his other rook over here to a d8, uh, and then rook e7. Now, I really like this approach from Nakamura. He says, "Okay, I know you're going to play rook to d8. Uh, that's going to be a lot of pressure, but I have the defense I need. I have both a rook and a queen right here, so I'm going to be pretty aggressive. I'm going to play rook e7." Anytime you can get your rook on your opponent's seventh rank, that's going to be a good thing. So uh, I definitely like his approach. Rook here a to d8. Then we have a queen b3, and this is threatening queen to f7. So this is going to be a mate threat that definitely has to be dealt with uh, very very quickly. So we see the rook f8, and then the queen comes back here to uh, d1. Now, rook d8 uh, doesn't have to worry about the, the mate threat because it's not there anymore. Uh, and then we see the same mate threat. Now, a lot of times in the past, I've seen these games be a draw. They have a threefold repetition and then just say, hey, it's super complicated. It's not worth risking it right now. Um, you know, both sides are completely okay, but it's going to be tough for one of us to win. Uh, but both, both these players, they, they almost have to have a win. They, they can't have a loss in this position with only two points through six matches. So, uh, they play on. Uh, Nakamura has a different approach, plays knight to d1. Uh, and now knight to d5. So he decides, okay, now my opponent, his knight's not controlling the square here on uh, d5. And this is a little bit different. Let's say we came back here where the queen came to b3. And if the knight were to come to d5 now, okay, now the knight could just take here. And then if we see the rook capture, then all of a sudden queen to b8 is just absolutely deadly. King h7, or yeah, king h7 and then rook e8. This is just too much for black to deal with. But now all of a sudden, once we come a little further and we say knight d1, now Topolot feels a little safer with knight to d5. Nakamura plays rook e5, just centralizing his rook, and then king h7. And this is one of those questionable moves. I'm not really sure uh, what Topolov is kind of trying to stop with, with king to h7. It makes more sense. Uh, to play something else, maybe rook over here to a8, uh, maybe start to put a little pressure on his opponents, rook down here, a1 makes a lot of sense in the future. He can start to put pressure, you know, as he's playing queen h3, threatening check right here, depending on where Nakamura's queen is. Uh, king h7, it, it's not right now at least in a huge amount of trouble, but uh, king h7, king h2, now this allows himself to get his queen involved and not have to worry about any shenanigans over here with queen to h3. So that's definitely a powerful move. Uh, knight to f6, uh, another one of those that I, I just don't know that it's it's helping that much. Um, instead, maybe pawn f6, forcing the, the rook to move, seems more logical to me. Uh, Nakamura's done a really good job, though. So we had Topolov give up one of his minor pieces to try to gain an advantage uh, especially with control of the center of the board. Uh, Nakamura has kind of thwarted all that off. He has both the rook, the knight, and the queen in the center of the board. He has a very nice pawn here on f3. And Nakamura still hold, he's holding down the fort. He hasn't lost any material from that. Uh, and so he's doing a good job. If he can just continue to hold on, you know, things are definitely going to be looking up for him towards the end game. Knight f6, bishop e3 attacking the rook. Rook comes over here to b8 attacking the queen first. Uh, but then the queen just going to capture here on b8. And after the rook takes on d1, then rook b1. Now, if you can't look at it and say, why did he just give up his rook for a minor piece? Isn't he just completely lost now, all of a sudden it's one minor piece and two rooks to one minor piece and one rook. And that's actually that's actually true. I think Tobolov looked at this position and said, okay, I have no way to win this game. Nakamura's just done such a good job. I kind of threw everything. I put everything on that bishop, uh, you know, sacrifice right here, trying to gain the momentum. 
That didn't work. So one last two raw. Rook over here to b8. Queen takes. Rook takes here. Now that here's the thing. If Nakamura does not play Rook b1, it's actually over. Topolov wins. It's a it's a checkmate waiting to come here. Uh, th there's no way to actually stop some of the threats uh, that we have on board. Rook comes over here to h1 eventually. Uh, now getting the, the queen here and then queen to g2. There's no way to, to stop this. And so uh, he kind of looked at and said, maybe Nakamura makes a mistake because he's made mistakes so far in this tournament. Uh, and if not, hey, I'll kind of play it out uh, and then... Hey, I'm not playing too well in the tournament anyway, so we'll just kind of go from there. Uh, Nakamura, though, in this particular game uh, is playing exactly how he needs to. So a uh, queen back here to a d7, rook g5, just sliding it over, knight e4, attacking. Uh, but that's fine. I'm going to go ahead and take your material right here. Uh, and after the queen takes, now queen over here to f4. Uh, and then that is game on board. Uh, just no way for Topolov to kind of come back. He's going to gobble up material. He's going to be up at least uh, one piece on board uh, and then just be able to kind of run away with it. So Topolov resigns. Nakamura gets a much-needed win, uh, and he went from tied for last place to tied for second to last place. He has three points. The leaders, uh, so everyone else in the tournament in round seven tied uh, with four and a half points. We have... Same guys, Kardiakin and Levon Aronian. Uh, in second place uh, with four points is Vichy Anand. For, uh, I know a lot of fans out there rooting for Vichy Anand uh, to kind of repeat in the Canada's tournament. Uh, everyone else kind of spread out throughout. Uh, and then Nakamura uh, down there tied with Fiddler with three points. Um, so hopefully Nakamura can kind of make a run, but he has a lot of room uh, to make up, especially with most of these players at least getting a draw. Uh, Nakamura has, you know, he's got to win at least three just to make up half a point uh, for, you know, kind of the leaders. And the leaders, Levon Aronian and Kardiakin, they seem to be winning a lot more than Nakamura. So, uh, Hats off to Nakamura in round seven, uh, and hopefully he does well in the rest of the tournament. Good luck to everyone else for the second half of the tournament. We have seven more rounds uh, to cover, but thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next one.